Hello again. In the last video, I looked at the role of privative clauses in relation to determining the standard of review. And after quite a long journey, we arrived at the conclusion that, for good or ill, as a result of the new presumptions-based approach in Vavilov, privative clauses now have little relevance in assessing the standard of review to be applied. The situation is quite the reverse in the case of statutory rights of appeal. While these were formerly important in determining the procedural route in making com a complaint of administrative injustice, their relevance in terms of whether a correctness or reasonable standard applied was not all that clear. As with the last lecture, I will go into the development of the modern law, albeit a little more briefly. But let me first say that the position that the Supreme Court of Canada has now come to is that where a statute provides a right of appeal, a correctness standard applies. So whereas the continuing rele relevance of privative clauses is now doubtful, the existence of a statutory right of appeal is now of enormous significance. As with my mini lecture on privative clauses, Let's start with an example which can be seen in Ontario's Health Protection and Promotion Act, Section 46. Any party to the proceedings before the Health Services Appeal and Review Board under this Act may appeal from its decision or order to the Divisional Court in accordance with the rules of the Court. An appeal under this section may be made on questions of law or fact or both and the court may confirm, alter, or rescind the decision of the board and may exercise all the powers of the board to confirm, alter, or rescind the order as the court considers proper. Or the court may refer the matter back to the board for rehearing, in whole or in part, in accordance with such directions as the court considers proper. As you can see from subsection 5, the right of appeal is in this case very broad. But rights of appeal can be broad or narrow depending on the wording of the statute in question. Now, what is the effect of a right of appeal on the question of the standard of review? You might have thought it obvious that the existence of a right of appeal would mean that a correctness standard would apply, at least as far as questions of law were concerned. That is, after all, the case in ordinary civil and criminal appeals. This is in fact a position now as a result of Vavilov, and indeed people once thought that this was the case before. However, there are a couple of decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada that called this assumption into question. The first was a decision in Bell Canada versus Canada Canadian Radio Television and Telecommunications Commission from 1989. In that case, Justice Gonfier, giving the judgment of the court, said that even in the case of statutory appeals, the principle of specialization of duties justifies curial deference on issues which fall squarely within its area of expertise. This was confirmed in Law Society of New Brunswick versus Ryan, in which Justice Jacobucci said at paragraph 29, the specialization of duties intended by the legislature may warrant deference notwithstanding the absence of a privative clause. The scope of deference might even have been said to have been broadened beyond the specific factor of specialization as a result of Dunsmuir, in which the majority said that on the question of interpretation of their home statute, an agency is usually entitled to deference and hence for the reasonableness standard to apply. Perhaps the most we could say with confidence is that the existence of a right of appeal was only one factor to be weighed in the standard of review analysis, and not to be weighed very heavily at that. This all changed with Vavilov. As you now know, Vavilov held that there is a presumption that the standard of review is reasonableness. What is important for now is that the existence of a right of appeal is sufficient to rebut that presumption. I will go into that, 
But first, I would like you to pause the video and read paragraph 17 and 38 to 52 to Vavilov. Now that you have read paragraphs 38 to 52 of Vavilov, you should be aware of the following. First, where a statute provides a right of appeal, then in hearing any appeal on grounds of law, the reviewing court will apply a correctness standard. And second, the justification for the Supreme Court of Canada's position is that the inclusion of an appeal mechanism represents a direction of the legislature to engage in a more exacting form of scrutiny. But this position did not escape the criticism of the dissenters in Vavilov. I am calling them dissenters, even though they agreed with the ruling, they fundamentally disagreed with the justifications. The minority wanted to see the concept of deference continue to do the work in determining the standard of review. The problem with allowing the mere existence of a right of appeal to rebut the presumption of correctness was that, as the minority argued, rights of appeal reflect different choices by different legislatures to permit review for different reasons on issues of fact, law, mixed facts and law, and discretion amongst others. You can see their position laid out by going to paragraphs 45 to 53. I recommend that you do that now. I don't know about you, but I found this quite a devastating critique. But to conclude, in Vavilov, the Supreme Court of Canada laid out a bold new position with respect to the role of statutory rights of appeal. Their approach was much less nuanced than the previous approach, but as the majority saw it, the nuance was very much part of the problem because it confused lower courts and it was difficult to apply. So far, I have only looked at what a right of appeal, and in my previous video, a privative clause signifies in terms of which test a reviewing court will apply, correctness or reasonableness. I am conscious that I have not yet talked about what these tests involve, beyond saying that in the latter the reviewing court is expected to defer to the primary decision maker. All of that is coming. In fact, part of the court's objective in its decision in Vavilov was to give explicit guidance to reviewing courts in applying the different tests, and we will go into that in due course. So. We'll talk about these things later, but for now, goodbye.